Professor Sanjay Baru and friends. Uh, it gives me indeed very great pleasure to be with you all this evening uh, when we release the latest book of Sanjay Baru. Sanjay Baru is a very well-known writer. His narration is always so gripping that when you read his book, when you take up his book to read, you don't put it down until you go to the end of it. Uh, that is the nature of his writing. 1991 is an important landmark in the post-independence economic and political history of the country. What makes 1991 unique? It is this question which Sanjay Baru answers in his book, 1991, How P. V. Rao Made History. There is a, not only a narration of events that happened, but he also wants to bring out who was a hero or the sweeping changes that occurred in 1991 and post-1991. The hero is necessarily P. V. Narasimha Rao. And he feels, and I think this view is shared by many, that the country has not adequately recognized the role played by Narasimha Rao in bringing about these changes, hence this book. Let me say that the book is a well-researched book. It is not simply a string of opinions and ideas. And I do hope that clarity comes as a consequence of the book Sanjay Baru has written. On your behalf and on my behalf, I wish to convey to Sanjay Baru our hearty congratulations. As I was reading the book, I was also looking at the various kinds of issues that he has raised. The book is written somewhat chronologically. What happened in the month of January, February, March in 1991? But the issues uh, do not follow any chronological order. Therefore, I have tried to see what kinds of issues that he has raised, to which our friend has added some more issues, some more questions. And let me highlight what I feel about those issues that he has raised as having been in some way, a partner in the events that happened at that time, in the very many decisions that were taken at that particular uh, time. There is a question that many, of, many, many people raise that about, is 1991 and post-1991 an extension of what happened in the 1980s? It's a question that he himself raises. There are two sub-questions under that. One is, are the reforms simply an extension of what happened in the 1980s? And the other is, the growth rate picked up in the 1980s, and therefore, does the beginning of the process of transformation occurred in the 1980s itself? I'll come back to this. The next questions relate to the crisis of 1990 itself. Basically, if you look at 1990 and 1991, you have the governments of B.P. Singh, you have the Chandra government, and then followed by the Congress government. How much were the B.P. Singh and the Chandra governments aware of the problems confronting the country. And they did, did they take early action? Is there a difference between VP Singh as Prime Minister and Chandrasekhar as Prime Minister? This is a question which is addressed by Sanjay Baru in his uh, book. 
Then finally we come to the 1991 itself. The main issue here is really <coughs> we are aware of the reforms, both in the political and the economic scene. I would talk more about the economic rather than the political side of it. Who was the leader of the reforms? We all know that Dr. Manmohan Singh led the charge and he articulated the basic principles underlying the transformation that India was seeing. The country faced an acute economic crisis triggered by a severe balance of payments problem. But the crisis was converted into an opportunity to bring about some fundamental changes in India's economic policy. Who was the author of it? Was Narasimha Rao an ardent admirer of reforms or was he a reluctant reformer? I think this question keeps coming up and this is being squarely addressed by Sanjay Baru in his uh, book. And uh, these are some of the issues that arise when you look at 1991. Now let me very briefly answer some of these questions. I believe we are not doing justice by saying the 1991 and post-1991 reforms were a continuation of the 1980 reforms. True, in 1980s, there were changes that were being made to make the economy more efficient and resilient. But they were all incremental in nature. I was a member of almost every committee that had been set up during the 1980s to look either at um, the shift from uh, controls, physical controls to financial controls, or to look at the balance of payments problem, and so on and so forth. All the recommendations that came as a consequence were essentially within the framework of licensing and control, but to make such changes as may make the, even the control regime more efficient. And therefore, I do not see, personally, the 1980 reforms as being a break. I think the real break occurred only in 1991. And some people also point out that the rate of growth of the economy picked up in the 1980s. It is true. It picked up to 5.2 or 5.3 percent per annum. But it also led to 1991, and it also led to 91-92 when the growth rate of the economy fell to 1 percent. And therefore, the engines of growth during the 1980s were high fiscal deficits, were high balance of payments uh, versus situation. I think you should take a look at the annual reports of the Reserve Bank of India also during this period, when almost in every report we had been writing about the fiscal imprudence and the excessive level of balance of uh, payments. And therefore, to say that 1990s is simply an extension of the 1980s is not a proposition that uh, appeals to my mind. Coming to the crisis year of 1990, how much were the leaders conscious of the crisis that was building up? The VP Singh government, in some way, was not willing to take the kind of action that required to be uh, taken. One simple decision like going to the, not simple, but one difficult, but uh, one decision that could have been taken was to go to the IMF or to the international organizations to get assistance. In the history of the Reserve Bank of India, that is a reference to a letter that the Reserve Bank of India wrote in August 1990 to the government, impressing on them the need to go uh, to the international financial institutions to obtain assistance. Had we gone in August 1990, much of the embarrassment that we had 
while negotiating in December 1990 or January 1991 could have been avoided. But the VP Singh government just simply refused to look at that particular option. That the Chandrasekhar government was bold in that sense of the term. Even though I remember Mr. Chandrasekhar telling me, what option have you left? Because at that particular point in December 1990 or January 1991, there was really no other option except to go to the international financial institutions to get relief. Therefore, the, the, the bold decision of Chandrasekhar government needs to be appreciated. I think there is a reference in Sanjay Baru's book to this, as well as in the political field, the bold decision that you took even to refueling the, uh, allowing the uh, um, military aircraft of the United States to refuel uh, in Bombay. Um, uh, so he was a bold man. But on the counterfactual issue, I am not very sure that I agree with Sanjay that had Chandrasekhar be, been the prime minister at that stage, at a later stage, he would have initiated the, the reforms. Uh, yes, the budget of 1991 contained many elements, many statements, which uh, do reflect a reform mind. But Chandrasekhar himself is brought up in an entirely different tradition. You may say that uh, Narasimha Rao and many others are also brought up in the earlier tradition. When, when, uh, when the opportunity came and when the crisis reached a certain proportion, they changed their mind, he could have also changed their mind. But I am not totally sure that the counterfactual, that he would have done it is really uh, uh, has great validity. Because one of the strong critics of the reforms later, in post-1991, was Mr. Chandrasekhar. Well, uh, as I say, in the, in the parliament, uh, the stand that you take depends upon the place where you sit. <laughs> Therefore, if you're in the opposition, you really uh, do that. Uh, but basically, I am not very convinced of that counterfactual uh, thing. So finally, we come to the most critical issue about 1991 and the reforms. Uh, it is quite clear uh, that industrial delicensing was an important element of the reform process. Not only an important, perhaps the most important element of the reform process, because that sent the signal that we are dismantling controls, we are dismantling um, counterproductive uh, licensing mechanisms. But that was allowed to be communicated in a very mild way and that is why the, the credit does not go very much to Narasimha Rao. But the fact of the matter is that he was a reformist. I can also tell you it was at that time I was, I was a member of the planning commission. And the eighth five-year plan was being written. And apart from the sketchy comments in the budget of 1991, one place in which you find yeah, a good statement of what reforms are about and what the holistic view that has been taken is found in the eighth five-year plan report. I had a hand in writing it and Narasim Rao went over it and he raised no objection whatsoever to it. And therefore I know fully that Narasim Rao was totally behind the, the reforms and he articulated the reforms in a manner in which that it could be acceptable to his party. Because there were many in the party who did not at that time agree with what was happening. But as they say, under the shadow of a crisis, we can do many things. And that is what we were actually doing at that particular time. But therefore, he couched 
his statements in a language in which it would appeal to the rest of the party. And that is where you find the use of the expressions like middle path and so on and so forth. And um, therefore, the impression that he was a strong reformer doesn't come through from many of his writings because even that Tirupati speech is, is not as bold as, as it could have been, corresponding to the nature of the reforms that we introduced. But my, from my personal experience and from the various actions that he has taken, uh, there is no doubt that he was the architect of the reforms. He was very much behind uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh. And he gave and provided the political support that was needed um, to push the reforms ahead. So what do, what do I say about, is there anything that I am critical of the book? One thing is that there is much less mentioned about Manmohan Singh. Maybe that is because um, Sanjay Bauru felt that so much has been written about him that perhaps there is no need for it. But I think in any book on 1991, due credit must be given to Dr. Manmohan Singh because it is one thing to have a general idea, but to put it into concrete shape and to provide a consistent set of framework of reforms, not only in the fiscal area, but also in the balance of payments, but also in monetary policy, but also in so many other areas, you needed somebody who is intellectually strong, who is committed to it, and so on. Therefore, I believe that uh, perhaps we should not underestimate the role played by, by Dr. Manmohan Singh. It is the duo, P.V. Narasim Rao, combined with Dr. Manmohan Singh, which was responsible for the initiation of the reforms and the carrying and reforms um, uh, could be introduced at, at that particular time. The only other thing that I would say is that Sanjay does refer to many things that, that go beyond 1991. One of the uh, facts that have contributed to the dimming of the fame of P. V. Narasim Rao was the 1992 incident at the Babri Masjid. That could be, uh, whether that could have been avoided or whether something else could have been done, it's a different matter. But the fact of the matter is that as you judge a person over a period of time, yes, he gave a new focus to foreign policy, look east was something that was emphasized by him, and so on and so forth. But I think we really need to bear in mind also that bit of indecision that happened in 1992, late 1992, regarding the Babri Masjid must also be pointed out in any book on PV Narasimha I am saying that it happened much beyond 1991. The book is on 1991. But since there is a reference to many things that happened even beyond 1991, it, it, it may be necessary to, to say that. Therefore, I... Uh, concur largely with the view that uh, Sanjay Baru has expressed, namely that the, the events of 1991 had been handled in a way in which they are handled because of Narasimha Rao's initiative, without his support, without his standing behind, the reforms could not have been introduced. Because we have had balance of payments problems earlier. It is not the first time that India had a balance of payments problem. But they were all solved in a totally different way. This is the first time that when we had a severe balance of payments problem, we devalue, which we have done before. Even on that, that is, uh, the book describes how Nasir Marao had some misgivings even on that devaluation and so on and so forth. But leave aside that. De devaluation has been done. But this is the first time after devaluation we moved on to making a more liberal foreign trade regime. That has never been done before. It is a very bold step when you are faced with an acute economic uh, balance of payments crisis to, revert to, to, to move towards a liberalized regime of knocking off all uh, the knocking off step by step the physical controls 
and reducing the um, import duty and providing an impetus to exports is a, is a great, great thing. I mean, I think this, these are not things that could be um, done very easily. Therefore, he was bold. He initiated the reforms. He provided the support which Dr. Manmohan Singh needed. I will only therefore conclude that reforms have come to stay in India. And the reforms have delivered in the sense in which we had a much higher rate of growth in the economy than uh, before. Uh, we have never seen a rate of growth of exceeding 9%, not just one year, in three consecutive years. And even if you take three more years after that, the average rate of growth from 2005-06 is really about 8% uh, uh, plus. Therefore, we have been able to do it. And at the same time, I think this was the period in which we were also able to initiate many reforms like the Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, which could satisfy. Therefore, I believe that even as we carry the reforms, we must continue to follow the twofold strategy of letting the economy grow fast and at the same time address directly the problems of poverty and other things through well articulated schemes. Um, before I conclude, let me also say that it is most appropriate that this book should have been dedicated and given on the first copy given to BPR Vittal. Um, all of you know BPR Vittal as a great administrator. He has a profound knowledge of India's finances, both at the center and the, uh, and the states. But he's not only an administrator, but he's a thinker among administrators which is a very rare virtue.